glad you guys are all here to worship the Lord and to hear from Him tonight. I believe He has something for all of us. Um, let us get into it. Father, we thank you for uh, getting us here tonight and uh, allowing us to just be here in your presence, Father. Um, it's just amazing that we, as a, as a living spirit, can be um, in communication and communion with the living God, Lord. So we just thank you uh, for what you've done for us, Lord, and we just pray that um, your hand is all over tonight, Lord. Whatever you want to do, God, have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Privilege, Lord, a blessing, and call 
the children, and you called sons and daughters of light. God, would you just have your way with our hearts tonight and our minds? Lord, we just want to glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Hello, hello. Get your Bible. Please open up to Genesis chapter 2. Uh, we're going to kind of just jump right into it tonight because uh, there is a lot uh, that should be covered. Um, tonight we're going to be, see, uh, be seeing the creation of man, the creation of Adam, the creation of Eve. Uh, we're going to be looking at the complexity of the human body. Um, and we're going to be seeing man put into a garden, and God's going to make us with the capacity to enjoy the environment around us. Uh, and then we're going to end it tonight talking about the institution of marriage. It is the only thing that we have institutionalized today, that three days back, uh, before the flood, before the fall, in Genesis. It's a very, very special thing. Um, so picking up in verse 1 of Genesis chapter 2, it says, Thus the heavens and the earth, and all the hosts of them, we're finished. So last week we covered Genesis 1, and in chapter 1, verse 1, we talked about God creating the heavens and the earth. Uh, God formed everything, the heavens, the land masses, the seas, and then he filled all of those things. Uh, with birds, sun, stars, moon, um, great sea creatures, uh, creeping things, and all cattle, um, and all those land animals. Um, but tonight, we're going to see in Genesis 2, God blessing that which he has formed. And filled. So in verse 2, it says, And on the seventh day God ended his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all of his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all of his work, which God had created and made. Now, some of you may not be reading out of the New King, uh, New, New King James Version. Um, but uh, some of the other uh, translations will say God ceased. And that's exactly what rest means here, that God is ceasing from creation. Day seven in the Hebrew language, the, the number seven is completion. And everything here is going to be complete. It is complete. Uh, and, and just note here that he's ceasing. He's not, he's not tired, and that's why he's stopping creation. Um, but, you know, our God, praise God, he doesn't give up. He doesn't get weary of us. He doesn't get tired of pursuing us. Um, in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28, it says, Have you not known, have you not heard, that everlasting God the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary, his understanding is unsearchable. And that's the God we serve. He does not get weary, does not get tired of our nonsense, he continues to go after us, he does not faint. Um, now, day seven is where we're at right now, and day seven is very unique. It's distinct from all other six days. Um, here, um, we see that God calls it sanctified. Some of your translations may say it's holy, and that's exactly what sanctified means. It's holy. It's set apart. This day is set apart for the purpose for, for specifically man to rest with God, to be with God. This is the first full day that man exists and they get to rest with God. They get to uh, just hang out with God, have communion with God, have fellowship with God. And we see that the seventh day becomes a pattern that gets set into motion. Uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, will be the fourth commandment out of the Ten Commandments to honor the Sabbath, uh, to, to rest on that day. And today, that still goes on in, in Israel today. Um, it's, when it's Friday night at, at sundown. We see the third star, star in the sky. All the way to Saturday to sundown, you see the third star in the sky. That is the Sabbath. It's not Sunday. It's, it's more so Saturday. But I've been in Jerusalem on a Saturday, and they, they literally do cease from uh, most of their works if, if they're religious. Um, and you, you were staying at a hotel. They shut off the elevators because you can't push a button because that will actually spark the elevator to make the elevator move. So you can't use an elevator on the Sabbath day. You see, and as we get to the New Testament, you, you see Jesus, he, he rebukes the, the religious leaders. He says, Sabbath, it was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The, the, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, uh, they made the Sabbath a day of stress rather than uh, a day of rest. And we could get all into that, um, but we can save that for another time when we're going through the Gospels. 
Um, but practically speaking, um, it's healthy for, for you and I to take a day of rest. I, I believe God has set that pattern in motion for a reason. You see, if you're working seven days, seven days, and seven days, and seven days, and seven days, and you're never taking a day off, you actually begin to slow down uh, mentally, emotionally, and, and more devastatingly, um, spiritually. And that's very harmful. But research has told us that actually every seven days, the, the immune system, system actually gets. It takes a day off. So listen, it is important for the human body to take a day off. And as a Christian, the best way to find rest is in Jesus Christ. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9 to 10, There remains therefore a rest for the people of God, for he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his, right? Where we're um, repeating the pattern set. Uh, set. And then in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all who are labor, uh, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And that speaks enough. If you're looking for rest, if you're looking for refreshment uh, to be recuperated, it's simply found in Jesus Christ. He can give you that rest by simply just coming to him. Now, let's get into verses four to, let's say, six. It says, this is the history of the heavens and the earth. When they were created, in the day the Lord God had made um, the earth and the heavens, before any plant of the field was in the earth, before any herb of the field had grown. For the Lord God had not ceased uh, it to rain on earth, and there was no man to till the ground. But a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. Um, just by reading these verses, we're, we're seeing this historical record laid out by us. By the author Moses. And, and if you look at verses 1 to 10, they're actually speaking in past tense, as if Moses got these all from ancient resources, uh, the creation of mankind. And, and, and Moses was able to read about it and write about it. But as you get to verses 11 and so on, it's all, it's all uh, present tense, as if there's an eyewitness to these events, as if God was giving Moses a revelation of creation. Uh, that he couldn't have figured out on his own accord, but God just showed him, and, and Moses began to write all these things down. Now, again, God created everything in Genesis chapter 1. Uh, but here in Genesis chapter 2, we're going to see how God actually more so maintained the things that he created. As it said in those verses, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth. Again, uh, we're going to see a uh, rainfall not until Genesis chapter 7. Uh, and there was no man to till the ground. But a mist went up, a mist went up, a dew uh, from the earth, and watered the whole face of the ground. So again, this is that firmament we were talking about last week, uh, this vapor cycle of evaporation and condensation. Uh, and, and it's maintaining the environment at a consistent, perfect um, temperature. And it's just this divine irrigation system that God has created, and he's maintaining that which he has created. So now we're going to get to some good stuff. It says, and the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Uh, so again, there's, there's no room for evolution here. Uh, man's not evolved into a living being, but man became a living being. And get this, when, when, when Adam was created, he was fully mature, as we saw last chapter with all the plants. And fully mature, you know, Adam didn't have these little baby teeth, you know. Uh, he, he, he was, he, you can see he has intellect. You can see that he has understanding. He, he can understand what God is saying to him. We're going to see that Adam will name animals. So, so Adam clearly knows how to speak the language. And typically it takes about three years of observation uh, for a baby or a child to learn a language. And here's Adam just fully mature, uh, knowing how to understand all these things and, and comprehend. Now, again, it says... Um, and the Lord God formed man out of the dust. Um, that word formed in the Hebrew language is it, yasar, describes the work of an artist. Uh, it means that God took time in creating people like you and I. It was more sophisticated of a creation than any other created being. Um, and then it says here that God um, formed man out of the dust of the ground. Uh, this insinuates a, a, a potter um, with the clay, he's working with the dust. Again, the same 17 elements that are found in the dirt outside make up the human body. 
Um, but, it, but it's pretty humbling to understand that we are just a bunch of mud balls. That is all we are. We're literally just balls of mud. Um, and, and it tells us in Psalms 100, verse 3. Ah, uh, know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us, and not we ourselves. And then it goes on in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 20. All go to one place, all are from the dust, and all return to dust. You see, <laughs> God, God forming man out of the dust of the earth was just him creating this, this physical structure. That's, that's not really us, but it's our structure, it's our tent, it's the being in which our spirit will dwell in. Um, you know, and Ch Chuck Smith was super funny about this. He talks about, you know, we're made from the dust, we go back to the dust. And those, those 17 elements are buried, and it kind of turns into fertilization uh, to grow other plants. And, you know, fruit trees, people eat that fruit, and they just ate Jimmy because the chicken was much better there. And that was taking all the nutrients. Uh, so it's just this constant cycle um, going forth. Um, but then it tells us that after God formed this physical structure, uh, that he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That, that's interesting. This, this is God literally stooping down and puffing uh, life into us. In the Old Testament, 24 times life is used. One time it's uh, translated as inspiration. One time it's translated as soul. Two times it's translated as spirit. And 20 times breath. I mean, here is God stooping down, breathing life, breath, inspiration, um, and spirit and soul into our very being, into this mud ball. Uh, he's giving us this capacity that is above any other uh, animal capacity, right? And, and the human body that God is creating here, it, it's so, so complex. And you see, God has given us mechanisms. He's given us instruments. He has given us the capacity to enjoy the environment around us. Uh, God is going to take Adam, the first man he forms, and places him in the garden. He's going to say, Adam, this is for you. Enjoy it. Eat all the fruit. Hey, the animals have a great time. Chill. You know, and it's just so complex. And now I'm about to nerd out for a second on the complexity of the human body uh, because I wanted to do it last week, but I want to do it now. Let's talk about the five senses. Very interesting. Um, so the first sense we talk about is sight, right? Looking. It's with the eyes. Now, the pupil has the most high portion of protein, and it's, it's in your pupil that your eyes are self-maintaining, they're self-cleaning, and they do two things. They reflect and they take in. Okay, so that means by, just by looking someone in the eyes, you can see if they're happy, you can see if they're sad, you can see if they're hurting, if they're grieving, because the eyes reflect what is on the inside. So that's why when someone dies, their eyes go blank, because the spirit that once looked through the eye is no longer there. And, and it's so interesting because if you go to other countries and you don't speak their language, just based on how their eyes reflect, you can tell whether they're asking you a question, whether they want to pray for you, whether they're thanking you, whether they're worried. It, all these things that I show what is on the inside. And it's so precious. I mean, just imagine looking into the eyes of Jesus. Imagine just seeing the love. Precious. The eyes reveal so much. And now, so the eyes don't just reflect, but they also take in, uh, the eyes act as if they're these radio receivers. And we're going to get a little more into that in a second. But your eyes are able to see over 100 billion different hues of color. You can look at this pulpit right here, and we can all agree, yeah, it's brown, right? But when you're looking at it, you're actually seeing several thousand different hues of brown. And, and when, you know, we have these 130 million rods and cones in the back of your eye, and it allows you to see from black to white a hundred different, a hundred billion different hues of just black to white. And that's why the human eye can see a star that is 50 million light years away. It can see a candle five miles away that's lit on a clear night. It's miraculous. And, and the light that comes into the eye is photons, and it shoots through your optic nerve, turning them into electrons. And, and it puts it on a screen before your brain and your consciousness. It, it's so intelligently designed. You see, sight is with the eye, but vision is with the mind. It, it, it's so miraculous to, to think about that stuff, and it gives you the ability, because there's also a memory bank attached to your mind, uh, that the things you see, you can picture. That's why when you lay, lay down at night in your bed, you can close your eyes and you can see the faces of those you love, and you can begin to pray for them. 
it, it, it is such a miraculous capacity that God is giving us as, as his delight. It's precious. And, and you know, today our, our world is steeped in pornography, and people are taking this miracle that God has given us and using it for things it was never intended to look for, to look at. The eye was to see the glory of God. The eye was to be able to see his reflection in creation. That's what the eye was created for, but we use it for things that it was never intended to be used for. Now let's talk about uh, the oratory system. That, that's the sound, right? <laughs> no doubt that ear loves music, it loves harmony. Uh, it knows things it doesn't like, uh, like nail scratching on a chalkboard. That, I just saw you shrug, maybe that dirty gave you some woo. But there's a memory bank even attached to that. Your mind knows, it knows what it sounds like. Um, but just imagine Adam in the garden, he can hear the birds chirping, he can hear the cool of the, of the breeze coming by him, all these things the ear can do. And it's all to be able to hear God's word spoken forth, it's able to be able to hear the things he's created. It's all to reveal a designer behind the design. You know, the, the oratory system is so unique that you can sit in a restaurant and talk to someone face to face, you can hear what they're saying, but in the background you hear dishes playing, you hear sirens driving by the restaurant, but now it goes into electrons, it goes to your brain, and your brain's able to divide up all those sounds and give understanding to you. And they say this is all by evolution. I don't know. Um, now, let's talk about the nose. Um, the nose is very significant, that it's be able to smell, right? God puts roses and all these wonderful flowers in the Garden of Eden uh, to give off fragrances, give off scents. All these things, and when you breathe, the, those scents actually placed onto your nose, again, turning into electrons, shoots to your brain, and it's actually therapeutic for the human body to be able to smell flowers and roses. Super, super therapeutic. But again, there's a memory bank attached to all of this. I mean, people, World War II vets who have watched Saving Private Ryan, uh, they said as they watched the battle scenes, they could actually smell the battle again. And we, we don't even understand how, but, but scent is connected to memory. It's connected to the mind. Now let's talk about touch. Touch is a very unique thing. I mean, it enabled me to be able to walk up here without falling. It gives you balance, right? The, the nerve endings in your foot, the muscles in your foot, uh, they shoot to your brain at a speed you can't even comprehend. And it tells you to take it right off your left foot and onto your right foot and, and vice versa and enables you to walk, but again, people, the scientists are just scratching the surface. They don't even understand how touch works. But again, touch is such a wonderful gift that he has given to us as mankind. To be able to feel the touch of your spouse's lips, to be able to have a hug from a loved one, to be able to feel the warmth of a fire, uh, all those things are gifts from God. And he's given us the capacity, again, to enjoy his environment. And now we have, last one, taste. <laughs> taste, yeah, right. That's right, hugs, it's a great feeling. <laughs> but taste, you know, your tongue actually has a pH level of about seven. It's just below alkaline, uh, but it's not strong enough to damage your mouth, but it's enough to break down sugars. But I mean, when you eat a piece of candy, you can taste that it's sweet, you can taste that it's sour. If you burn something, you can taste that it's burnt. Um, I mean, the tongue is miraculous, and tonight you were eating pizza, and your, your tongue signaled to your brain when that pizza in your mouth was mush, and you'd be able to swallow it, it shoots down into your digestive tract, into your lower intestine, your smaller intestine, and, and, it, and, and the, the stomach acid, I don't want to get too much detail, but it's strong enough to clean a carpet. And we're going to stop there with the digestive tract. But it, it, it is just crazy uh, that God has given us these amazing taste buds. Uh, it, you know, monkeys and cows, they don't care about garlic and salt and pepper, but for us, he, God knows he, we need to fuel the machine to serve him. Right? So he wants us to be able to have the ability to at least like food. You know, because we need food in our system to serve him, to, to walk with him, to be able to open up our mouth and give praises to him. It's very, very unique. We need uh, nutrients to fuel the machine. And that's your mind. Your machine's the mind. You're not a machine, but your brain, that piece of meat in your head, uh, that, is, that is a machine. But, but you are more than that. God has created you with, with all of that to be able to enjoy everything that he has given you. Now, there is one more capacity that is greater than all other capacities. And I, I mentioned it a little bit last week, and that is what is called the sixth sense. You know, have, have you ever been, you know, you left home, and all of a sudden you're like, I just have this bad feeling. I, I need to go home. 
something's wrong, right? And, and you go home and you see that the oven's on, and you're like, what, what was that all about? That, that's your sixth sense. But in the same way, it's, it's like, how do we feel the presence of God, right? How do we know that our sins are forgiven? Is that by taste, by touch, by smell, uh, by looking? No, I mean, when I first became a Christian, I used to ask the question, how do I know that I'm saved? Like, how do you know that you're saved, right? And then people would just say, I just know that I know, that I know, that I know. And that's the sixth sense. You see, God has given us the spiritual capacity to discern. And so it tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 to 15, it says, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself um, spiritual, uh, well, I lost my spot. But he himself, ba ba ba, uh, is rightly judged by no one. Interesting. You see, God has given us the spiritual servant to be able to make aware of, of what we need in a sense. You see, God knew in Genesis chapter 3, man would fall. God knew before the foundation of the world, he was going to have to send his son. And for that to happen, you, you see, God needed us to understand what redemption is. In order to be saved. So God blesses us with eyes to be able to read his word, ears to be able to hear his word, uh, touch to be able to taste and see that the Lord is good. I mean, I mean, all these things God has blessed the body with to understand him, to understand redemption, and just to be, to be able to enjoy where we live. <laughs> it's precious. So, again, sorry if I just bored you, but it, it's just amazing to, to think about what God has done. It's amazing. So, let's get into the next verses. Make our way. Uh, the Lord God planted a garden eastward of Eden. Now, I'm going to stop there. You see, a lot of scholars want to debate where Eden is. I mean, apparently it, the garden was eastern of Eden. Uh, but, I mean, after the flood hit, the, the geography, it, it all changed. So, I mean, you can debate it all, all day long where it is, but at the end of the day, all I know is Bible teacher, it existed, it was real, uh, it was there. Um, so in this Eden, in this garden of Eden, uh, there he put the man whom he had formed, Adam was placed in there. Verse 9, And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to sight and good for food. Uh, the tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of uh, the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, so here the garden is created. It's telling us every tree that has grown is pleasant to the sight, as in everything that's growing is a tree to mankind. It's telling us here that the food is good. Um, and it's all being used for food, right? And, and there's no death here in the garden, so no, none of these fruit are, are rotting. Uh, there's no worms in the apples. Um, and we see these trees, we're going to see a flow of water. So again, this is just a perfect environment, that there's no beer cans on the ground, there's no pollution, there's no cigarette butts, cigarette butts under the trees, right? It's just this perfect thing that God has created. Um, and so now we're going to get to the rivers here in verse 10 that supply uh, these trees that we just talked about to flourish. Uh, it says, now the river went out from Eden to water the garden. And from there it parted, it became four river heads, four headwaters, you could say. Uh, the name of the first is Pishon. Um, People have debated whether this is the Ganges River. It goes from India to Bangladesh. Uh, but again, we don't know this. All, all geography has changed. Um, it is the one which skirts the whole land of Havila, where there is gold, and gold is the land that is good and pure. Uh, but Delium and onyx stone are there. So here in the garden, there is just wonderful gems, jewels, and precious stones all around. I, I couldn't even begin to try to picture it. That's just a reflection of heaven. Uh, the name of the second river is Gion. Uh, it is the one which goes around the whole land of Cush. Now Cush is, some people say it's modern-day Ethiopia. Uh, now this Cush could have been different, but if it is modern-day Ethiopia, scholars suggest this is the Nile River. Um, anyways, the third river here is a Dekel. Some people say this is the Tigris River. Um, it is the one which goes toward uh, the east of Assyria. The, the fourth river is Euphrates. Now, as we were just going through that, again, we, we see all these familiar names, right? We see Euphrates, and we see Assyria, uh, Kush, that is now Ethiopia, all these things. But, but you know, you got to understand these aren't the same as today. These are pre-Diluvian names before the flood. But 
clearly these names were stored in the memory bank of the man. So after the flood, they recycled these names. They began to use them. We're like, oh, we're going to call that river the Euphrates. It's probably not the same Euphrates, but it's just the new world Euphrates, and so on with Assyria and Ethiopia, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, but verse 15, so the Lord God said, I mean, so the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Uh, we're seeing Adam here his first job, his first assignment. Hey, hey Adam, you gotta tend and keep the garden. You see, God works, right? He saw him working the first six days, and God creates Adam in his likeness. And, and no doubt, Adam shall work too. He's going to work. Now, working in that day was not to be drudgery, right? It was to co-labor with God with complete delight, to walk with God in the cool of the day. But then we see the fall hits in Genesis chapter 3. Uh, we see a curse brought, brought that every man is going to have to sweat for their, from their brow in order to put bread on the table. Um, so that's the kind of thing. Uh, but, but again, you know, Adam, he's supposed to be just living in complete delight, tending and keeping the garden. And then it tells us in verse 16, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Uh, so here we're seeing God give Adam the first commandment and also the first warning. He says, Adam, eat whatever you want, but that one tree there, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you, you do not touch that tree. And it's interesting to me because God always warns us in advance. Everything that we as human beings fall into, God has long in advance already told us, don't do, don't go that way, man. Right? He says, I told you not to touch that. I mean, you touched it, right? I told you not to look at that, but you looked at it. It's, it's going to kill you, right? Curiosity kills the cat. Um, now, I'm not going to get to all the detail here of, of what this tree necessarily is, but, but in this message here, uh, this tree of knowledge, good, and evil is placed here for choice. Um, but, you know, many people want to debate, you know, that if God is all knowing, Right? Um, why would God put that fruit in that tree in the garden if God knew Adam was going to eat of it? You know, nothing, nothing new has changed, right? People are always blaming their own disobedience on someone else or on God, right? We're going to see Adam blame it on God and on his wife and then even going to blame it on, on Satan. But at the end of the day, your disobedience is your disobedience. That's your choice. And that's something you have to own up to. But listen, so we see this tree here, and I, I said it's a place for choice, and I'm going to expound on that a little bit. Um, you see, when God first created man, that was the greatest capacity he gave men was free will, choice. You know, if God doesn't give man free choice, then we're just merely a robot, right? God will say, do that. we will be like, okay, God, man, you're going to do that. Okay, Lord. And God says, I love you. And you're like, okay, God, I love you too, right? It's just not, there's nothing to it. There's no substance. There's no meaning. You know, um, but it's interesting. You know, God lets man go the way man wants to go, right? And God honors the choice of any man, right? If he wants to be with God, great. If he doesn't want to be with God, okay, that's on you, right? But no doubt, God wants the heart of all. But God is a loving God who will not force his love upon anybody. So he places this tree here, and he says, Adam, listen, you can prove that you love me by being obedient, right? You not eat that fruit, or you can go the other way. You can disobey what I told you not to do, and you can eat that fruit, and you're just telling me, you know, I, I, don't, really, I don't really matter to you. You know, you'd rather live and do things outside of me. Uh, very interesting, you know, uh, husbands here, right? If you're the only man on the face of the planet, and someone wanted to marry you, I mean, there's really no meaning to that, right? Because you're the only guy, you have only choice. But if there was Larry, you know, whatever, Curly and Mo out there, and she still chose you, right, over everybody else, there's a little more meaning to that, right? Because she chose you. So again, God here is saying, Adam, listen, you, you have the free will to go, to go whatever direction you want to go. You, you pick. But listen, I'm telling you, if you eat that fruit, you're going to surely die. It's going to kill you. And it's not that I want to hold anything back from you, Adam. I just want to protect you. You see, God, it's not that God doesn't want us to enjoy life, experience life, and have fun in life. But God sets these parameters out to protect us. 
You know, God's going to go on to tell us the institution of marriage and how it's supposed to be one male, one female, right? Not male with male and female with female, because what has that produced? Nothing but confusion and a bunch of lists of sexual transmitted diseases. And I mean, I could just go on about that. But then God also tells us that you are to refrain from sex outside of marriage. And when we break those parameters, we're losing the protection and shield of God. Because when people are having sex outside of marriage, you know, they're, now there's single parenting, there's kids being raised without a mother, a father, uh, there's, there's an increase of abortions, there's an increase of orphans, there's an increase of adoptions. And I'm not saying anything of those things are, are, are like bad, like the adoption part or anything, but, but listen, like that stuff wouldn't necessarily need to be um, a thing if we stayed in God's protection. And, you know, God, everything God tells us to do in the beginning is to protect us. You know, God's not going to tell us to do something for no reason. There's, there's always a purpose to it, and it's for our protection. So let's get into uh, verse 18. It says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. So throughout Genesis, we have seen God say, It is good, it is good, it is good, it is very good. But this is the first time that God says, it is not good for man, as it's not beneficial for man to be alone. I will make him um, a comparable, I mean, a, a helper comparable to him. And a comparable is like a, a suitable, um, a, a counterpart that balances them out, uh, a complementary, corresponding. Uh, but listen, it's interesting to me here that Adam is, a, is not even aware of his need that he's alone. Interesting. God is aware of Adam's need before Adam is even aware. And that's just back to Scripture, too. God tells us that he will provide for our needs before we even ask. God knew Adam was going to have this need, but Adam doesn't even know it. Very, very interesting. Um, and it, it, it says that it's not good for man to be alone. And, and that remains true today. I mean, no doubt, uh, we see in the New Testament that God has called some people to be single. Um, but, you know, listen, if you feel alone, I don't know if this works for you or somebody you know. Listen, God God sees you, God hears you, God knows your cry, He knows your concern. I mean, He's the one that said it is not good for man to be alone. He knows that. And, and it's interesting to me because we see that Adam doesn't go out on his own accord to go seek after a, a helpmate comparable to him. Rather, Adam stays in the garden, he stays with what God has entrusted him, and then we're going to see that God brings him a helper comparable to him. You know, someone once told me, Brian, you need to focus on becoming the right person before you go searching for the right person, right? It's more important to be the right person than to go out looking for the right person. And that, that, that remains true. And then when you do that, God blesses it. And we're going to see that God will bring Eve uh, to Adam. And it's interesting, too, because he says, I am going to do it, right? It's God's work. It's not your work. I am going to bring someone to you. Uh, don't go out on your own hunt. Don't go to the bars. Don't go to the, the clubs. You know, you're a Christian. Stay in the church. God knows where you work. God knows where you live. God knows where you where you go to. You know, where you, all those things. And God's going to bring someone to you at the right time, at the right moment. Uh, that's how God works. He, he blesses you when you're faithful with what He has given you. Now, let's get into verses 19 to 20. Um, it says, "Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air." And brought them to Adam to see what he could call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, to all the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, yeah, there was no, there was not found a helper comparable to him. Um, here we see again, Adam's very intelligent. Uh, he's, he's a genius, he's smart. I know he's just enjoying the garden, eating the fruit, and walking in the presence. He just start naming up some animals, um, and he does. He begins to God brings him an animal, and he names it. Very interesting. Uh, but how did God come up with these names? I mean, how did Adam come up with the name which he chose? I mean, I don't really know. But throughout Scripture, you see there is some sense to naming, right? Uh, Sarah names her son Isaac because she laughed, and Isaac means laughter. Huh? Real clever, Sarah. Um, but I believe that Adam's kind of doing the same thing. You know, I don't know what giraffe meant in the pre-Diluvian days or hippo, but I believe it was some kind of detailed uh, description of these animals. Like when God brought forth, by the way, this is a real animal, the hairy screaming armadillo. And when God brought that before Adam and said, hey, Adam, what do you want to name him? 
uh, you know, Adam was like, well, he's hairy, he's screaming, he's an armadillo, I'm gonna call him the hairy, screaming armadillo. Uh, so I think, you know, and then there's a mustache bird out there, you know, that his well, mustache is a bird, I'm calling him the mustache parakeet. You know, and I think there was some sense to, to God, I mean, to Adam naming these things. Again, he's fully mature, he can speak, he understands. Uh, very interesting. But we see here in these verses that after Adam goes through all these lines of all these animals, he begins to realize he has a need. Again, God here made Adam name all the animals to make Adam aware of the need. And he says, listen, God, there is not one that I should want food that is suitable for me. I mean, sure, that one can climb a tree and grab me food, but he's a little hairy, Lord. I mean, you know? <laughs> but he's like, God, make someone suitable for me, Lord. And listen, if you're on the search for someone, you've got to be patient. Again, whether that works for you or for someone else, you got to be patient unless you find yourself with a primate instead of a helpmate, right? <laughs> so, verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on him, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man he made into woman, and he brought her to the man. So again, Adam's just enjoying the garden, enjoying the presence of God, and him and animals. Like, oh, God, oh, and, you know, all these things. And then, again, God is aware of Adam's need, so he puts him into this deep sleep, this deep rest. Now, this isn't anesthesia, right? Now, there's no pain before the fall. But this is just this is just the perfect presence of being in the arms of the Father. And he says, i got to put you to sleep. You know, and it's in this moment when Adam's sleeping... That he's resting in the Lord. And that the Lord brings him a helper to parables to him. Now there, there are many single Christians out there who, who, you know, they end up compromising. They end up settling for less. You know, again, they're hunting down for a spouse, uh, climbing through the trees, going to the bars and the clubs, trying to find someone. But it's very devastating what can take place. I mean, you guys know how this world's going to unfold, our society, right? Just all the problems that can evolve from marrying someone who's unequally yoked, and, you know, and all the court dates that arise. And again, it's just going to be devastating. And maybe that's some of your guys' story. I don't know. And that's okay. I mean, God's going to work through it. But God, you know, he wants to make the perfect, suitable partner for you. And it's when you're resting and pursuing God that he's able to do such a thing as that. Now, that's basically, honestly, how I met my wife, right? I, I, I wasn't, I didn't go to Bible college to go to bridal college and find a wife. I went there to seek the Lord and to rest in the Lord. And, and as I was pursuing him, you know, Leslie and I knew each other for a time. Uh, but it wasn't revealed to me or her that we were going to get married. Uh, but as we were resting, you know, and I even prayed that, God, bring me my wife as you brought me to Adam. And, and it began to happen with the arranging of our circumstances, the stirring of the Spirit in both our hearts. Where, you know, and, and here we are. And here we are. <laughs> We're here. Um, but it says here um, that, that God's a rib from Adam. Now, that, that word rib in the Hebrew language is actually an ambiguous term. And we don't really know what it means. All we know is that it's somewhere close on his side, it's somewhere close to, to Adam's heart. Very beautiful picture here. Uh, Matthew Henry wrote this. He said, The woman was not made out of Adam's head to rule over him, or out of his feet to be trampled on by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm, to be protected, and near his heart to be his beloved. Very precious. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 7 and 9. You know, we we'll probably just read verse 7, but I think I have 7 and 9 up there. It says, uh, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the image of the glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man is not of woman, but woman from man. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man. Interesting. You see, the wife here is supposed to be a reflection of the husband. And here, God is taking a piece close to Adam's heart. And he makes his wife. It's just this direct uh, reflection of who the husband's supposed to be. They're the complementary. They go hand in hand together. Very beautiful. I mean, you're seeing here that, that Eve is not made out of dust. Like Adam was. Eve is made out of Adam. Pretty unique. And I mean, this insinuates to us involvement uh, in genius, it insinuates to us in orchestration. Um, you know, marriage it, it is so sacred. And I don't care what legislators have to say or what the culture has to say, marriage is completely sacred. 
And, and, and it's interesting that when, when a man and a woman come together, it, it, there's this completeness that, that goes all the way back to Genesis, all the way back to the, to the, to the Garden of Eden. Very beautiful. And so that this peace that was taken from Adam can only be recovered by him embracing his wife. Us as men, we're, we're lost puppies without our wife. You know, again, some people are caused, called to, 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 to singularity, but, but men are lost without their wife. Something was taken from him. And the only way man can get it back is by having his wife, embracing his wife. Um, so here in 23, it says, And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Wonderful. Here, Adam is exclaiming. He's excited. He says, Lord, yup, that is my cup of tea. Thank you. And she, I didn't even know I had any until I saw her. As I tell us, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. Very precious. And it says here, uh, these words, woman and man, in the, in the Hebrew language, uh, woman is isha, and man is ish. Uh, so uh, isha is taken out of ish. And these words are described, actually, in the very tone of husband and wife. This is what it's talking about here. A husband and wife is a very divine picture, right? A picture of Christ in the church. Paul tells us in Ephesians 5.30 uh, that, that we are as the church, the flesh and the bone of Jesus Christ. Just as Eve is the flesh and bone of Adam. So again, this, is, this, this, marriage, this institution of marriage uh, is a direct picture of Christ in the church. And it says in 24, it says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, right? Not his girlfriend, not his fiance, uh, but be joined to his wife. It's only reserved for the wife. That they shall become one flesh. Again, just the, the institution of marriage taking place here. Uh, to becoming one flesh it is reflected in intimacy. It's reflected in the face of a child. Right, you look at the child and say, wow, I can see mom and then I can see dad and then and it's just this reflection. Um, but, but what does it mean that a man shall leave his father and his mother? This is for the men, this is more of a man should do this. Um, so I guess we can go both ways. Go on, go that way. Um, but it means severance, right? It, it means to become a unit. It means no longer saying mine, but it's now saying ours. Whether that's money, uh, the house, um, you know, anything in the house, the, the vehicles, it's all one. I mean, if, if you're it's two not becoming one, uh, you might as well get one fit. It, it, it's there's division in the home, but two need to become one. Um, but the, mo- the, 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 the the man must leave his father and his uh, his mother. He must leave and cleave to his spouse. That means the spouse must become number one. Of course, uh, the man still honors his parents. He still loves his family, but there's a change of preference. There's a change of priority. Um, now the wife is number one. It's to always side with her. Now, there, there are marriages that are being hindered and destroyed because people are allowing their parents to get a foothold in their marriage. And it's actually hindering them from letting God do a work in their marriage. You see, if the, the, one of the fathers just come down and yell at the son-in-law or the daughter-in-law and say, you said that to what, my son or my daughter? Right? It's just going to cause more division. But, but I mean, we're all grown-ups. When, when two become one, it's, it's time to start dealing with your own issues and, and make it happen. Now, there are many people today that live in a divided home. Right? They have it all mapped out. They say, that's mine and that's yours. Listen, if there's division, it's time to lay down the weapons, right? If, there, if there's weapons being used, such as, um, you know, the silent treatment, lay that weapon down. If you're withholding intimacy in order to manipulate your spouse or to, to do something, you got to lay that weapon down. You see, the, the Satan loves to just divide and conquer. If he can cut off any lines of communication, he will. And we know how that game is so ugly. It just, it just it makes it worse and worse. Um, very, very dangerous. We're living out and walking out what the enemy wants to do when we act that way. Um, but, I mean, again, nothing's changed. I, like, there hasn't been a perfect marriage, right? Since, since the Garden of Eden, there hasn't been a perfect marriage. So it's wrong for us to expect from our spouse perfection when God himself doesn't keep, expect perfection from us. How do we know that? We'll look at, look at his son upon the cross, right? When 
God, God died for us because we're not perfect. And that's the way it has to be. And so how, how, do we, how do we fix to becoming one? Well, there needs to be repentance. It's turning away from your old habits, maybe the way you're reacting in the situation, and going about how God would have you do it. Uh, there's, you can reconcile, right? You can let down your natural stubbornness. Um, you, you can stop being historical. You, you can stop being prideful and be willing to admit when you're wrong. All these things. And when you're able to do that, God's able to work. God's able to move. It's, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Now, maybe there's people who, who married an unbeliever, and they're saying, well, I made a huge mistake. I married an unbeliever. God, what am I going to do? Listen, if you marry that person outside of God's will, now that you're married, you're in God's will. You stand together. It's still your goal. It's still your aim and your desire for two to become one. Right? Whether someone's believing or not, it's still a, a commandment for the husband to love his wife and for the wife to respect the husband. That, that should never change. And, and so, again, we just have to do in marriage, just do our best. One guy said, do your best, you commit the rest. Right? We, as, 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 a, as a husband, as a wife, we all do our best and commit the rest to God. Um, but, I, you know, I, I, I hear a lot that a lot of people who need counseling Right, it, they say my marriage is dying, and it's like, okay, one of the questions is how your relationship with Jesus Christ. How's your prayer life? How's your devotional life? Are you reading the Word? Are you giving this thing? Because I, as a person, I can't possibly love my wife the God the way that God would have me if I'm not in love and close to Jesus Christ first. It, it, when you're spending time with Jesus, you're able to. Do better at it. I can't say I can ever be perfect at it. But I can do my best with the rest. Now, our concluding verse here is 25. It says, And they were both naked, and the man and his wife, uh, they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. They were not embarrassed. Um, the word naked here, it, it refers more to a physical naked. Physical nakedness is more, it's described actually as a tree opening up its branches. Right? You see, Adam and Eve, uh, they didn't have any defenses up. They were God conscious, not self conscious. Uh, they weren't self centered. And we're going to see in Genesis chapter 3 that they lose something because they say, hey, you notice we're naked now. So they were obviously clothed with something. What were they clothed with? Well, Revelation chapter 19, verse 14. Tells about us in our um, glorified bodies here, our unfallen bodies. It says, In the armies of heaven, that's you and I, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on a white horse. Interesting. Where we're shined with God's glory. And, and so to me, when we're back in our glorified bodies, right? We, we're not we're naked, we're not ashamed. We were clothed with the righteousness of Christ. In the beginning, we were clothed with the righteousness of God. But when we sinned and let sin into the world, we lost that. We're now physically aware of our flesh. Right? We lost our, our, our spiritual clothing. We, we lost our, the righteousness that God has given us when he created us. You know, it's very interesting to think about in Luke chapter 24, when Jesus rises again. And he's amongst the disciples. And he says, hey, touch me. I'm here, I'm, I'm, I'm flesh and bone, he says. Not flesh and blood. Flesh and bone, because his blood has been poured out on the cross. And it's interesting, too, because Paul even writes that flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom of God. And here's Adam, just moments ago, exclaiming, my wife, she is my bone and my flesh. Not my blood and my flesh, she's my bone and my flesh. Now, now this is just a thought. Right? I mean, you guys want me to side with me, but I was thinking about this. This is interesting. Uh, perhaps we, before the fall, right, or in our unfallen bodies, we're clearly in our glorified bodies, do we have the same drive system that Jesus Christ had in Luke 24? Or do you go through walls, you could, do, you, could do, you could just ascend and appear and disappear? Interesting to think about. Do we have that capacity before we fell to do those things? Very interesting. Now, I don't know the answer. I don't know if that's actually how we operated before the fall. But could we go through dimensions, right, between heaven and earth? Right? Because we see Satan in the garden, and Eve's not far off guard. It was normal for a 
angelic beings that dwell with mankind in the Garden of Eden. So did that give us that drive to be able to do things like that? And will we have that again when we're in our glorified bodies? Again, I don't know the answer, and we're going to find this all out when, when we go to be with him. It's going to be miraculous the miraculous things that God shows us. Lord, I have so many questions. So many questions. Can you just spray it on the screen of my brain? Please. <laughs> so we'll close there. Um, we're going to get into chapter 3 next week, so go ahead and read ahead. Um, we're going to get into the fall. Very interesting. We're going to see sin enter the world. We're going to see death enter the world. And we're just going to answer one of the biggest questions that mankind has today. And why do so many bad things happen in today's world? Well, it all originates from Genesis chapter 3. So we'll get there next week. Father, we thank you uh, for your word. Thank you for allowing us to go through Genesis chapter 2 together. Thank you for being uh, just everything we need you to be, Lord. God, for those uh, who may feel alone, God, would you comfort them? As they're just faithful with what you have given them. And God, uh, would you bless every marriage here? Uh, help us. God help us as we go forward and as we aim to glorify you as you becoming one and just um, being a reflection of you in the church, Lord. So thank you, Father. May you bless our week as we go out.